This is one of the most peaceful places that I've ever been to. It's the Cyril Hart Arboretum, which is on the edge of the Forest of Dean. It's such a lovely place. Uh, if you ever get a chance to come here and to see the do, because it's great. I've come here today to talk about something that I think is possibly the best deal in landscape photography, and I'm going to try that out right now. A Sony uh, A5100 camera with the kit lens. Now, I picked this whole thing up maybe about a year ago now for about £300 sterling. It's been sat on top of my computer for the past year or so, and I've been using it as a webcam. I, had, I thought, okay, if I get a cheap APS-C camera, I can make my webcam look better, which I did. I've now changed that camera for my old X-T3. That means that I'm gonna get rid of this. There are issues with it as a webcam. It has this weird face effect, that it, skin effect, that it'll smooth out your skin, and it looks horrible. And you can turn it off, but it doesn't turn off when you're using it as a webcam. So why am I saying this is a good deal for landscape photography? Well, let's find out. Okay, well let's go through, if nothing else, the specs. First of all, it's got a little pop-up flash. This is nothing to do with landscape photography. I just like it, I think it's fun. Uh, this is a 24 megapixel camera. It's quite old now, you can pick them up for not very much money. The lens on it, this, I've been told by so many people that the lens on this thing is the worst lens you can possibly get. Interestingly enough, the same lens that I'm filming with right now. It's not bad, it's not the best lens in the world, sure but it's actually not bad at all. And you've got bracketing, so if you're doing a sunset and you want to, to bracket the, the shot, you've got that. You've got a two second timer. Now, I don't know, I don't know this camera very well, so I don't know whether or not that um, bracketing and two second timer can be used at the same time. I'm not sure they can. The one problem that everybody comes uh, up with with these cameras is the menu system, and the menu system is a nightmare. I'm used to Fuji, I'm used to everything being at your fingertips. With this, I have to turn the camera on, make those same decisions, and then go and find it in the menu. Now, I'm sure after a while, you get used to kind of the, the basics, uh, basic uh, things that you can do. To do something like changing the uh, aperture or changing the, your, your um, shutter speed, is a bit annoying. For every time I've turned this on, it comes up running on NTSC. I don't need to know that. I just need to get to the bit where I've got a picture on. I've got a dial here, and if I turn that dial, my shutter speed is changing. Um, I, if I press, I can't remember, this, this bottom bit here, then I've changed it to aperture. Brilliant, okay. And if I press the one on the right, then I can select my ISO, which for today's shoot I'm just keeping as auto ISO just to be on the safe side. But it's not as good as having a dial up there. And you know what? Fuji cameras are great for all the dials they've got across the top. Any other camera that's got one of those dials on the top, um, actually, and, the, and the, the things at the front and back, the little scrolly wheels at the front and back, they are substantially better <laughs> than what you're getting here. But what you are getting here is a mirrorless camera with uh, technology in it that actually hasn't advanced a lot since the camera was first released. So I found something interesting and a place where I can put my camera so I can film myself doing this. Uh, this is the camera, easy enough to turn on. You do this, the little thing comes out. You've got a screen on here and the screen doesn't do much. You can pull it out like that, which is kind of cool, or you can flip it up like that. So if you're vlogging, you can do that. Although this isn't a good vlogging camera because it doesn't have a, an audio input to it. Uh, so if you wanted something like that, you'd have to get one of the, the better models. Changing the settings on this, pretty simple. Now, this might be me. I haven't seen a histogram or I haven't seen an exposure meter or anything on here. So at the moment, I'm just, it's just guesswork. It's sheer guesswork. To, uh, let, let's line this up. I'm going to line myself up here, and if I tap on the screen, it will actually focus and, and track on the bit that I've tapped on. One of the problems with it is that you don't have a viewfinder with this. Um, and you'd have to upgrade to the 6000 if you wanted to get the viewfinder. For a lot of landscape photography, I found I'm putting a, a, a camera on a tripod, and so I'm not really dealing with the viewfinder very much. What I'm dealing with is uh, the exposure on the on the the screen and the screen on here isn't bad but it's super reflective 
So let's line this up. Let's, uh, I'm focusing kind of middle distance here and I'll get the shot there. So I suppose what we should do is take this back to the, the studio, uh, take a look at the actual images that I've got, not just this one, there's several others as well, and see actually how it's turned out. I started this video by posing a question. Is the A5100 a good deal for landscape photographers? The short answer is yes, if you're a beginner. The image quality is actually rather good. The sensor is the same one that's been used in all of Sony's APS-C lineup. For more seasoned pros, you'll find the lack of normal controls an annoyance, and the tapping on the screen to focus can be a real pain. But if you're coming uh, from a mobile phone and you want to upgrade, well, that's something that you're going to be used to already. The camera does a good job at bridging the gap between mobile technology and having a proper camera. It's lightweight, it can be shoved unceremoniously into a pocket, and when you want to start upgrading, it takes the same E-mount lenses that you'd be using for the rest of the Sony lineup. You have the ability to shoot in full auto mode or use the manual settings as I did in this video. And as for image quality, it's pretty damn good. So I've got a few different images here to take a look at. They're nothing to write home about, but that's because of the photographer and not the camera. The first is a close-up of a bud and it shows the close focusing ability of the lens as well as some of the color renditioning. Typically, cameras have a problem with either greens or yellows. Uh, you can see them both represented in this image and as you can see, it's done a rather good job of it. All of these images, I should say, are edits from the original RAW files and you can pull the image around a fair amount before you start to see any degradation in the image. Having said that, it's not as good as the Fuji X series, and I'd suggest probably not as good as anything that's full frame. Interestingly, I took a picture of the thumbnail for this video using the ZV-E10, and I noticed practically the same performance with the RAW file. That's a nine-year-old camera that's now keeping pace with a camera that's about well, two years old. The sensor in this camera is as good as any other Sony APS-C camera. All you're losing in technology is what better processors and more feature-rich, newer models can deliver. The next image is a tree stump, and I wanted to show off how sharp the lens is. I should point out again, I was told this was the worst lens that you could use for this camera, and yet it's delivering results that I would have been more than pleased with as a brand new photographer. So the camera lens combo is sharp, the colours are good, the 16mm angle gives you a lot to play with. In fact, 16 to 55 wouldn't be too bad for a street photographer on an APS-C camera as well. And of course, if you want more subtlety in, a, in an image, well, you've got it. Here you can see the interplay of the light on the ground, easily captured by the camera. But my favourite picture of the day has to be this one, a gnarled tree stump sitting in the middle of a forest trail. It's not the best image in the world, but it does show that this little nine-year-old camera can still perform some miracles. If you're looking for a first camera, either for yourself or for your family members, the A5100 currently sits in that sweet spot between the best technology at the cheapest price. Sure, there are better cameras, and there are also cheaper cameras, but nothing else quite delivers the same level of technology for those on a budget with expandability that can keep you going for some time to come. That's what I think anyway, and I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. That's it for this video, and until next time, keep taking those photos.